welcome everyone to the official opening of the Subversive Forum, the second live uh, event. Uh, on this, our guest tonight is uh, Agnes Goji, uh, who is a sociologist, uh, and her talk will uh, from Hungary, from Budapest. Her talk will be um, concerning the what she titled the, the new left and social movements in Eastern Europe specifically, which is also the topic of her research, uh, especially in the years since the last crisis. Uh, she will try to present the uh, uh, experiences, but also obstacles and, and give some um, openings for, for our discussion about strategies. Uh, strategies of, of the new left in Eastern Europe. So, uh, without taking a, uh, any ma more time, uh, please, Agnes, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, <laughs> so thanks for coming. Uh, so, yeah, the, the Invitation and the talk is based on a book that I wrote and it came out last year and I thought in the beginning I would just give a disclaimer about it in case you want to check it out later. So uh, it's called uh, Middle Class Politics and the Global Crisis in Eastern Europe and it has the, the empirical part on a Romanian and Hungarian comparison. And the disclaimer is that it belongs to the past. <laughs> so <laughs> the idea of the book is from around 2017. Uh, and then, like everything, it took years to uh, realize itself. Uh, but the debate it speaks to is the debate of the 2010s, right? Uh, and it's this particular debate about how do you understand post-2008 demonstration waves in different parts of the globe uh, how they relate to each other, especially how do you understand the ones that are outside of the Western core, like in Eastern Europe, uh, and what about the left uh, politics uh, in these waves. And what I tried to explain in the book was um, how to place Eastern Europe and middle class politics uh, in this story. And what I was trying to do with the, hung the Hungarian and Romanian comparison was to show how if you use a world systems based methodology, you can see how different politicization of the same 2008 after effects uh, fit structurally in the same global crisis process. Okay, and these are the details that I won't go in now. We are in a different context, right? Uh, this uh, great financial crisis of 2008 is not the biggest crisis that we are concerned about. Um, so I just thought that I would bring some points on the new left, on Eastern Europe, and global crisis. Uh, I will do it in the reverse order, so first on the global crisis. Uh, some of these are also described in the book, but some of these aren't. So, about the global crisis, uh, of course, if you approach it from a world systems perspective, then it's not about moments of financial collapse or supply chain breakdown or a pandemic. Uh, what, what I wanted to bring out here was how useful it is, uh, this uh, long-term uh, research tradition that shows uh, what they call hegemonic cycles of accumulation across capitalism history. So they look at capitalism as one big development, the historical dynamics of capitalism as a global system. And within that, they identify these hegemonic cycles of accumulation. This doesn't mean that these cycles go around and around all the time. There is continuous accumulation of capital, of monopolization, of the penetration of reproductive circuits, even of uh, military capacity. But there are cyclical dynamics. And very briefly, uh, what these uh, repeating cyclical dynamics would be was that would be that there is a first phase uh, in which, uh, under some uh, hegemonic rule, like they speak about the Dutch or the British or the U.S. hegemonic cycles, there is the build-out of a typical model of 
uh, production and trade uh, across the whole system and with a corresponding geopolitical control. <laughs> and after a while, this gets oversaturated. Uh, and then you have the second, the down, uh, downturn phase of the same cycle. Uh, like when you think of the US cycle, uh, you can think of how for this uh, production uh, goes from, first from the US, then to Europe and Japan. And after a while, all those cars and all those other things that are produced, uh, the same system doesn't produce this, the buying power for all those things. And uh, very directly, this is experienced as an overproduction uh, uh, problem, but basically it is the problem of the whole uh, system as a structure. And then what typically happens in the second phase uh, is that capital since it is not so profitable anymore to be invested in the real economy, it flees to the money markets. So this is the financialization phase, which we know since the 70s, but it happened with the previous cycles too. Uh, and the other thing that typically happens is the spatial fixes, which is Harvey's name that he gave for the, what happened after the 70s, but uh, it also happened in the previous cycles. Uh, and this is when... Uh, there are these new <laughs> long-term uh, structures of trade routes, production chains, also geopolitical domination like colonialization in order to compensate uh, for the decline of uh, profitability of that model that you have. Uh, and this is known also after the 70 years as globalization, <laughs> but you used to have this in the previous cycles too. So. After the 70s, uh, we call this phase typically now neoliberalization. Uh, and we know the, the features of it. What I just wanted to emphasize is that it has different fa uh, phases in the core and in non-core positions globally. And uh, out of these, the core parts are typically overemphasized because of the domination of, you know, Western reflection in global uh, knowledge uh, structures. So in the core, neoliberalization would uh, look like the industrialization. Instead of industrial jobs, you have uh, uh, precari precarious service jobs. Uh, you have strong financialization, accumulation of wealth, but it is a growth without jobs. There is increasing uh, inequality. Uh, these uh, phases, uh, Arigi called the Bell Epoch, that appears in the core in the financialization phase of the, uh, of the hegemonic decline. And it is as if the compensation would work, at least for the core elites. That's why you call it a uh, bell epoch, but it doesn't because it leads to the financial bust and we know that uh, after 2008. Uh, now in the non-core parts, and this is also important, that the industrialization, uh, which you know, they even created these universal terms for it, like postmodernity, late capitalism, all that. Uh, in the non core parts, it looks like total uh, industrialization. It is the relocation of industry, but it happens uh, in a fragmented and flexibilized way. It's always a give and take, it doesn't allow uh, the creation of, of that sort of stable uh, labor. Uh, organization that uh, it did uh, in the core in the first part of the same cycle. Uh, what looks like financial successful uh, accumulation in uh, the core, it rather looks like debt and the, the structural adjustment uh, that goes with it. And what look li looks like the that type of uh, oppressive freedom of neoliberalization that, you know, the likes of Foucault theorized in the core. Uh, in, uh, in the non-core parts, this neoliberalization is not only the regulation, it's also very much authoritarian, if not, you know, in the shape of military juntas. Uh, what is common, though, uh, is that globally, the share of uh, labor in capital's incomes uh, uh, is shrinking, uh, and there is the formation of these uh, long and very vulnerable supply chains, which we know are breaking down uh, since the COVID. 
Another thing that is interesting socially, and this is something that the World Systems people uh, very uh, interestingly show in the previous cycles too, uh, is that is about the politicization of what they call uh, junior partners of elite groups, you know, in different social constellations. Uh, this would broadly correspond to what we call in journalistic language middle class, but uh, what they mean by junior partners is uh, their position within the hegemonic structure. So, you know, when the, the first part of the cycle is going on, there is accumulation, there's the production of a real economy position for junior partners, uh, you know, like labor aristocracy, traders, uh, things like that. Um, then there is a working political alliance between hegemonic elites and their junior partners that also keeps the system stable, it keeps the dominated. dominated. Uh, but in these <laughs> crisis phases, there is a politicization of these uh, junior partners because those real economy positions in which they were sitting previously are destroyed. Uh, and because they see that financialization, meanwhile, is redistributing wealth uh, in an uneven way. So they see that the rich are getting richer. And this is, you know, in Occupy language, this would be the 1% against the 99%. Uh, it's an ideological perception of the historical dynamics from the junior position. Uh, but they bring marvelous examples of, you know, the Dutch uh, uh, traders uh, speaking the same language uh, back in the 18th century. Um, okay, so, so there is this political destabilization and the role of these uh, junior uh, partners within that. And what will be interesting about this, how the post-2008 middle-class dominated demonstration ways go, is that on the one hand, of course, they can create new alliances now towards the popular classes. But another possibility that uh, actually is more uh, numerous is that they can go for reconfiguring inclu uh, increasingly exclusive alliances uh, with elites. And this has been dominant in semi-peripheries uh, since 2008. Uh, and the previous uh, discussion with uh, Ilya Budraevsky, uh, they already talked about India or uh, Turkey. So, so this is the, the new right and the new middle class uh, alliance that uh, that is also uh, one of the outcomes. Uh, now, another uh, aspect of this uh, hegemonic uh, crisis and post-2008 story that is often uh, missed from the picture because of this dominance of the Western perspective is, is the story of China. Uh, you know, now, since COVID, there has been a discovery in, in Western public uh, life of the race of China, but that race has been happening throughout uh, this story. So, uh, China becoming the workshop of the world, uh, you cannot overemphasize how much, how, how big of a part of this uh, spatial fix, structural fix of the declining hegemony it was. And then also, whatever happened after 2008, you cannot overemphasize how important the Chinese uh, post-2008 economic stimulus was to it globally. And just to bring one example to that, so uh, other than this Western story of post-2008 uh, movements, uh, another relatively visible and important story where the left was there uh, in this period was the Latin American uh, pink tide uh, governments. So they have a earlier wave of neoliberalization than it happens in the core because first it is outsourced <laughs> uh, to non-core places. And then there is the social reaction to that and based on that you can have the pink tide uh, left governments. Uh, but what do they do? So they tried, on the one hand, to redistribute, mostly to urban uh, workers and the poor, and uh, they also tried to build out uh, these cooperative structures uh, based on uh, uh, socialist ideologies, but the material basis for all this is based on extractive industries and export based on that, and where did they export all those uh, agrarian products and raw materials? Uh, it is the new Chinese demand that uh, supports all that. 
which means that the fact is that China is the new workshop of the world, they have the new uh, uh, stimulus packages and, and the whole uh, proletarianized workforce of China is, is mobilized to, to swallow this global crisis fix. Among others, it is the basis of the pink tide governments. Um, and then uh, we know that uh, after these conditions are uh, switched off, uh, uh, they typically failed. So, sorry for this uh, longer bracket on the political perspectives. I just wanted to see how the same crisis process can be seen differently from different positions politically. Uh, what happened since uh, in this uh, resembles what in this tradition is described as the final phase of the hegemonic crisis, which is the, what they call the systemic chaos. Uh, so this is when <laughs> even the spatial fixes don't work anymore. Uh, the uh, earlier uh, structures of production and trade in their new globalized form, they start to break down. And we know this with all these uh, uh, breakdown of supply chains, which is happening now, reinforced by COVID, but not only, it's also reinforced by uh, other things. Um, another thing that happens is uh, the increasing interstate rivalry and militarization, uh, not only because of uh, states need to reorganize, you know, whatever remains of some sort of secure uh, uh, real economy and uh, their own capitalist lobbies encouraging that, but also militarization itself becoming an investment target. And we see that uh, now too. Uh, and uh, colonialization and what they called in the cl uh, classic period of colonization, the scramble of Africa uh, is also part of these phases. And I don't want to go through all the elements that uh, happen today that resemble that. Uh, but yes, we do see this background of the supply chains. We see the, this new geopolitical tensions. Uh, it's not only the, uh, the Russo-Ukrainian war, it's also how much the, the, the China-US uh, relations be, uh, shifted from from a relatively working uh, capitalist collaboration throughout the spatial fix into the Chinese technological upgrade reaching the level when uh, US tech companies start to lobby uh, uh, against uh, this kind of uh, collaboration. And that this, that there is this, what, what we used to know as trade war is becoming more and more a geopolitical and, and uh, militarized uh, competition. Uh, and where all these <laughs> come together and also uh, uh, touch uh, the effects of the climate ecosystem and, and the uh, raw material crisis is uh, probably you saw what is this new uh, policy, big policy idea <laughs> of this uh, COVID, post-COVID period, it's the industrial policy. Uh, if you read policy debates of, uh, in you know, capitalist discourse like Financial Times or whatever, it's uh, very much uh, uh, there. Uh, it's partly because this is how uh, Western elites uh, react to the challenge of China. They say that ah, they have been doing industrial policy all the way. We also have to do it. Uh, but it's also about this new securitization of the supply chain. So. Do you have your own lithium mine? Because most of the lithium mines uh, are controlled by uh, five East Asian companies. Uh, do you have your uh, semiconductor industry for your own supply chain? Uh, all that. Uh, it is the same thing happening with, uh, with labor, <laughs> because we also have a global uh, labor regime crisis uh, ever since uh, the Chinese labor started to be not so uh, cheap. Uh, it is <laughs> an unsolvable question where to go from China. You don't have another uh, pool of uh, con such uh, controllable uh, labor uh, and of such good quality anywhere else. So we have this new scramble faces uh, both in Africa uh, and in uh, Central Asia. And in some sense, Eastern Europe is also part of that. I will. Uh, get back to it uh, and just to 
they have point out another similarity, this financialized infrastructure building, just like it used to be with these uh, speculative railways and everything in the uh, end of the 19th century, we also uh, have it again. So where is Eastern Europe within that? Uh, I, I will try to speak less about the more distant past, but uh, yeah, just to recuperate <laughs> the, the main uh, points here. So if you look at it from the world systems perspective, then you don't see socialism and post-socialism as two different worlds, and at one point uh, in time we just stepped from one into the other. But the idea is that socialist systems were always part of the world economy. Uh, there is this uh, André Gunder Frank uh, uh, point that basically if you analyze uh, external trade, then socialism uh, was integrated into the world economy in the typical semi-peripheral position, which means that you have an uneven relationship that is unbeneficial for you uh, with the core countries and you try to compensate uh, for it by a similarly uneven development uh, that is beneficial for you uh, with the uh, third world. And this is true if you look at the trade, this is true also for those countries who at the same time ideologically have been promoting solidarity uh, with the third world. Um, and then if we look at what was the, you know, the effort that was happening uh, in this uh, world economic integration, then it is very similar to what was described by dependency theorists in Latin America. It is this uh, import substitution industrialization effort. Why is it so important? Because your problem in your world economic integration as a you know, non-core country is that you are technologically dependent. You always pay more for your uh, imports than uh, uh, what you can uh, uh, export because of this productivity difference between higher levels and lower levels of technology. And then you try to make up for this problem by upgrading your own technology. Then your problem is going to be that in order to, be <laughs> in order to upgrade your technology, you have to import higher level technological inputs uh, from core countries, and somehow you have to pay for it. Uh, there is this export pressure that you have to at the same time export so much that you can pay for that more uh, expensive uh, technology inputs and these parallel efforts, typically these countries cannot sustain for a long time. They try to do it mostly by completely oppressing and uh, exploiting their own uh, agrarian uh, resources. Uh, but it typically doesn't work. Uh, and after a while, this hard currency pressure turns into a debt problem. Uh, and you have it uh, within you know, the historical process. Uh, more after 73, when you have all these cheap oil dollars uh, in the world money markets and these countries start taking them. But then very soon they become very expensive, uh, these debts, uh, because, uh, because of basically what the US is doing in governing the uh, world money markets through its hegemony uh, of the dollar in order to uh, manage its own productivity problems. So very shortly what happens is that with the Forker shock and late, later with the Plaza Accords and other uh, instances like that, after a while uh, the uh, dollar uh, interest rates raise. This means that the money flows change. Now they, all of them want to go back uh, to the US and everybody else's debt is appreciating. And this is how Eastern Europe but also the, the rest of the globe basically went into the that crisis uh, of the 70s and 80s. Uh, and we know the consequences of all that in the socialist transition, uh, like this uh, cheap privatization, depreciation of the workforce, reindustrialization in a worse uh, uh, position of the value chains, the opening of uh, the markets for Western goods and, and services. We know all this. We know this as a critique of the post-socialist transition, but it's really important to emphasize that this is basically a common history, uh, despite the big political uh, differences that have to be emphasized in the case of socialism. But just one thing, if you didn't read it, this uh, Walton and Seddon's book uh, from 98, The Politics of Global Adjustment, 
Uh, if you didn't read it, I really recommend to read it because it really gives you this uh, very direct sense of community and it's mostly about the third world. Uh, okay, and then we know that in the 2000s, in this condition, Eastern Europe goes into the same debt boom uh, as the whole world does, but in a uh, dependent uh, position, uh, for instance, through foreign banks, through uh, foreign currencies. Uh, then we have the 2008 crisis. We have the post-2008 protest waves all across Eastern Europe, but their politics are quite diverse. We couldn't say that it's, it's you know, the classic Occupy type of uh, protests that are happening here. I, I wouldn't go into the detailing of these because now it uh, counts as the past anyway. Uh, but I think dominantly the way the post-2008 uh, story can be described in Eastern Europe is that it, it is the continuation of a subordinated integration in uh, Western capitals crisis management. Uh, of course, being part of the European Union only uh, reinforces that. Um, so, in this long-term cyclical perspective, what this resembles, it pretty much resembles this late 19th century to the interwar boom periods, which many of our uh, national historical writings typically uh, describe as, ah, yeah, that was the good time when, when we started to have real capitalism, it's just that after that everything went down the drain. Uh, you know, our, our nice uh, capitals are being born, lots of uh, financialized uh, railway and other infrastructure projects happen. Um, it is the start of our industrial booms. Um, so, basically, it is the same uh, period of outsourced investments into financialized infrastructure, outsourced manufacturing investments, uh, and then it ends in the systemic crisis uh, phase, it ends in hot military conflicts. And what we see after 2008, uh, especially in Central Eastern Europe, is, is very much the same. So, it is this boom of Western manufacturing and services relocations to our uh, region because of the cheap labor, because they are compensating their own profitability crisis uh, in their countries. Uh, it is uh, this boom of financialization, uh, financialized infrastructure and construction booms. Uh, you know this also as this problem of uh, uh, housing prices, how they go up. They go up because of the, all the financialized investments. Mm. One thing that is a bit different from these earlier waves is that within this new hegemony shift, that it's not only from some Western country to the other, but it is towards China, uh, Eastern Europe is also at the crossroads of this new geopolitical, geoeconomic shifts. So, of course, one of the big examples for it is the Belt and Road Initiative, how it crosses the country, countries, and uh, because of that, there are all these deals that you uh, have to make. Um, another one is uh, within the framework of what I mentioned as the industrial policy turn and the securitization of the supply chains. So just to bring one example to that, so you have the Rio Tinto, uh, Australian mining company, as you know, investing into uh, Serbia, into this super toxic uh, lithium mine. You have the uh, Linglong car tire factory that is uh, uh, moving away from China because of environmental regulations relocating to Serbia. And then, meanwhile, in Hungary, you have these new uh, Samsung and the Chinese battery factories, uh, uh, heavily is also subsidized by the government, uh, this kind of relocation. So like this, there is a value chain that is built that is relatively secure, it is in Eastern Europe, and on the top of it, uh, Hungarian and since 2015 increasingly Ukrainian workers build it into Volkswagen uh, uh, cars uh, in uh, new uh, uh, factories in Hungary. Uh, so this is one example of how Eastern Europe is becoming one of these intersection points. But as previously, this, this is a boom that happens at, at an almost final stage of the relocations that are part of managing the crisis. And this is not building a stable you know, development. Uh, all the previous times, it, uh, it was 
the geopolitical conflict aspect that uh, that burst out uh, in the end and uh, again uh, we see that uh, happening again and then for the last part uh, to say something about the new left and in this context so uh, what i mean by east european new left it's not this 68 new left with capital letters it's just with small letters it's just a descriptive term for my generation basically uh, how <laughs> how we all of us uh, discovered this political perspective after it was completely uh, exercised from the uh, public life uh, after the transition uh, as I wrote in the abstract for this, I won't repeat that, and as you very much know, uh, we managed to go through some process of political institutionalization. There are some elements that can be called successes in that respect. There is also uh, what I think is another thing that is important is this broadening and deepening of activist expertise in certain fields where people have been doing uh, persistent work. So this means that there is some sort of examples of embedded uh, left political capacity. But as we all know, in face of what is going on, uh, all of these capacities uh, uh, pretty much uh, too small. And I don't want to engage in this self-flagellation story, why it's not too small, because I, I've been there, I really don't think uh, we could have done significantly more than that. Uh, also, I don't want to engage in these, uh, uh, how to say, this projection type of thinking, like what the left should do or, or how to imagine hope. Uh, but rather, what I want to say here is about, you know, uh, just speaking to this common thinking about how you can optimize, optimize within an existing situation that is there anyway. Uh, and I just want to bring one point to this, and that is about the middle class basis of this new left. Uh, of course, it can be said that the outreach is not only to the middle class, also not everybody who is part of these scenes comes from the middle class, but I would stand my ground on this, that what is the political you know, explicitly political basis of this new left uh, is a middle class basis. And of course, the story about what, what about the middle class in left politics is this <laughs> endless uh, source of struggle. Everybody can accuse each other uh, by being middle class, while at the same time everybody is typically middle class in these debates. Uh, so no, that's not what I'm trying to do here. Uh, for the sake of brevity, I would just, from all these historical debates, I would just uh, use this uh, professional middle, uh, professional managerial class PMC uh, term uh, from the US New Left, uh, because it sort of applies to our case and uh, because it's also being revived in contemporary debates. So there the idea was that, what about this uh, PMC? Uh, it's this uh, new proliferation of uh, professorial managerial positions uh, where what happens is that uh, the social capacity for knowledge and organization is extracted from the social body and it is uh, condensed in uh, and monopolized in positions where people can get, if they get the uh, you know, diplomas for that, and then with that, they can be employed uh, by capital and the state to do what capital and the state wants to do. Uh, so, you know, it is part of the social domination uh, mechanism and it is a growing uh, segment of uh, the population as this new for this modernization uh, proceeds. And the classic uh, argument about the political uh, preferences of this group was that on the one hand they are opposed to capital because uh, what capital wants me to do as a professional uh, usually limits my professional freedom that I would like to uh, imagine. But they are also opposed to the workers because uh, all the rewards of this position comes from uh, the professional position being a dominant position towards the workers. Uh, and then the question was, okay, what happens when these guys are politically mobilized? Uh, typically, when in times of crisis, they turn against capital. 
And the left critique was that, yes, they turned towards capital, but very similarly to this junior position that I uh, mentioned in the word systems language, um, this critique of the PMC said that uh, when they mobilize against capital, PMC members still maintain they, their preference towards uh, uh, the benefits of the PMC position. So uh, what they would propose would be something about the, the state doing more social things in which they would be the, in control, but they would do it for the benefit of everyone. Uh, and yes, uh, we know the East European versions of the criticism uh, too, uh, from Gilas or Conrad and Salini. Uh, it was about how socialist intellectuals were doing this. Uh, an important aspect of this uh, that uh, then also applies to our case is, is the political consciousness, how it works. And it is described in these classical critiques too, uh, how the middle class political consciousness works through hiding its own interest and expressing it as others' interest, uh, which is because of this uh, uh, PMC position. Uh, but it's not only a lie, it's not like I know that I want to be the museum or director or a healthcare minister, uh, and I'm just fooling others to think that I would be doing it for their benefit. Uh, no, <laughs> like elsewhere too, here too, people experience uh, history through ideology. So this is the actual characteristics of uh, middle class political con consciousness that you don't only express it, but also experience it, your own politicization for your own interest, you also experience it as wanting to help others. Uh, and then much of this sec second part of this book uh, that I wrote was about this, so how this happens in Eastern Europe. So one of the points was that it happens in a specifically sharpened way because of the semi-peripheral characteristics of middle class formation, mostly because it's limited and you typically need some state help to maintain it. Because the global middle class formation uh, is mostly concentrated in the core. Uh, so one of the funny things that uh, Eastern European researchers described about this was how the international demonstration effect works through local middle class ambitions to emulate core middle class lifestyles and how, because of this, uh, they uh, spend on uh, luxury Western products, and by this, they uh, contribute economically to the uneven development, uh, which is their problem, because that's why they cannot be a, a local middle class enough. Uh, and uh, there, there is also, from, this is from an Estonian researcher, Ragnar Nurkse, but there's another uh, nice quote from uh, Aleando Portress, maybe you know him, uh, uh, Latin American Marxist, and uh, he <laughs> he has this famous quote, I, I won't say uh, all of it, but it's about how uh, if uh, European travelers come to Latin American cities and see all this enlightened uh, middle class who lives and, uh, you know, its cultural consumption and robes and everything is like in Paris and London, then they wonder how, despite all these, uh, these countries can be so underdeveloped. And the answer is that they are very much part of it. Um, and then another aspect of the same thing from another East European researcher, Andrew C. Janos, is about how, for all this, very strongly <laughs> throughout their history, East European middle classes have been mobilizing the state to help them do this. They really don't need the state, and you know, you can really show it uh, through state budget uh, histories that they always got higher uh, percentages of state budgets than, uh, I don't know, per, uh, Fran France, uh, no, French middle classes at the same uh, time period. Uh, and what he shows is how this also happens within the ideological history of uh, middle class politics, uh, which can be super funny as you read it. I'll just uh, bring one example. So uh, he looks at the 1848 revolutionaries, uh, the East European middle estates who tried to do the same revolutions that were happening uh, in Western Europe at the same time. Uh, 
but they are, as he says, liberals in ideology, but ethicists in interest, uh, because, uh, because of their own, uh, this is the only way you can uh, produce your own uh, position. And then another point, another aspect of this same thing that I bring in this uh, book is the, the historical aspect. So when you look at waves of middle class mobilization throughout historical uh, boom and bust periods within the region, then, then how, do this, how do these middle class ideologies uh, travel in them? Uh, if you look at the progressive ones, you know, that are for, you know, helping the people and everyone, not the right-wing ones, um, then there is this typical pattern that in crisis periods, when the middle class positions are, are threatened or annihilated, uh, then in, in the progressive uh, side, there is this turn towards uh, popular alliances. Uh, but then in following boom periods, the same cohorts of political activists, uh, they uh, enter into alliances with the ruling elites of, of that boom period. And then, you know, in, say, in 1848, uh, the, the middle estates are pretty much anti-elite, but then if you look at the same cohort in the 1870s, uh, most of them are already within the alliances of uh, this new uh, national uh, uh, industrialist uh, elites. Uh, then uh, the turn of the century and the early 20th century, another crisis wave, then you have this new radicalized uh, middle-class politics. Uh, when you look at you know, the more stable phase of socialism that is coming, uh, then there is this phase of new socialist dominant bureaucracy uh, that Gilas and the others were uh, criticizing. In the 80s, again, uh, you have a strong wave of middle-class criticism that is also social. So, so these dissidents, they wanted liberalization and marketization, but it was part of the argument that it has to happen uh, because of socialism produces inequality and poverty. So describing the poverty within socialism was really part of the critique. Now this part, of course, by the time these cohorts take power in the 90s and carry out all the liberalization, then the discourse changes, then it's about how, sorry people, this is the price of freedom. And then after 2008, we have a new wave, right? In which people like me are also <laughs> active. Uh, and, and then your question is, okay, so, <laughs> Uh, what is uh, happening here? Of course, uh, if you look at it only ideologically, this is the story of ideological, you know, the, the truth is born and then the treasure uh, happens again and the truth is born again and then the treasure happens again. But if you look at it in, in terms of structure, then there is this complete continuity of, of the same effort to, to maintain and expand the same class position. So, okay, this was what I unwillingly <laughs> realized about also my own sentiment uh, towards, uh, you know, left revolution uh, in my own historical uh, position. Um, and some of the book then is about uh, identifying and just showing some of the ideological and organizational consequences of, of this given situation. Uh, mostly in post-2008 uh, organizing. But what I want to speak about here, and this is the last point, is rather the possibility to use this knowledge for the organizing, because of course this doesn't mean that uh, it's completely hopeless. It just shows that these patterns exist historically. Of course, individually, there were always people who, say, died in the revolution or, you know, never did the ideological turn at the right time and they remained the losers of their generation, but they somehow maintained some important uh, knowledge. We ourselves learned from such people who are very few in our countries, but they maintained the left tradition uh, uh, throughout the 90s. Uh, so I'm really not saying that there is not a a possibility to, to use this kind of reflection. I mean, that's what the method is about, actually. It's an alternative tool other than your phenomenological sense uh, to understand what's going on. So, in this spirit, <laughs> I just wanted to bring attention to some effects that basically I was writing about in the book too, 
uh, but, but now I think they are becoming even more strong. So some effects of this uh, uh, middle class aspect, and one of them is that this orientation towards thinking progressive politics as a reproduction of representative and uh, technocratic positions for ourselves, uh, this has some consequences. One of them is that the, the political thought and action <laughs> uh, tends to be state-based, uh, which means that the structures of bourgeois state and bourgeois electro uh, electoral politics are going to the, be the main medium through which we organize, we create any kind of organized power, and through which we have any kind of organized connection to the people that we are trying to uh, work together with. Uh, this, uh, and now you, you will recognize many of the points of contemporary discussions because after the failure of the Sanders and Corbyn campaigns, also the Western discussion sort of turned into this direction. So, one of the consequences is this, of this is that even if you reach some kind of position, since you didn't have the occasion to build out any kind of alternative organizational base for exerting power, when you reach the position, there is very little power to exert the power into an anti-systemic direction. And uh, yeah, that basically whoever managed to get there from these post-2008 uh, uh, movements uh, feel that. Um, and there is another uh, layer of this that is also quite uh, much voiced now, especially in Anglo-Saxon debates, uh, is that when you are building the uh, electoral movement, uh, that kind of organizing has the, yeah, it has the, the quality that doesn't enable you to use it to support your uh, efforts to execute any kind of policies. Uh, so, yeah, just to bring one classic example, so when the Syriza is there, it has all the uh, democratic uh, uh, political background, uh, but it cannot do anything against the Troika because of the Troika's complete economic grip on those voters. And the Syriza doesn't have any kind of economic uh, organization that, or any kind of power that could uh, go against that in any way. Uh, another uh, consequence of this state-based direction of thinking is that since your main connection to people is through the electoral legitimation, your thought and your rhetoric is going to be about promises. I mean, you, if the idea is that they have to put you into power because that will be good for them, there has to be a legitimation for that, and it is a positive uh, legitimation. So, yes, it is the rhetorics of promises. And that is really hard in, in such a level of crisis in which we are now. Uh, so, one part of it is that it is going to be reactive in the sense that whatever bad is happening, we will try to resist it. But it is going to be also re reactive in the sense that it will be regressive to the earlier rights. Like, let's try to bring back whatever used to be there. And basically, in all of the West, but even in Eastern Europe, this is a globally reactionary uh, standpoint. It is really hard to you know, to formulate in these politics the necessary losses of any kind of uh, uh, global reorganization that would be globally equal or can do anything uh, uh, meaningful about the climate crisis. Then another similar consequence is that it's, it doesn't, it is basically unable to build out an internationalist labor perspective of international politics. Uh, so, you know, you are bound to the state, you are bound to speaking to the citizens and to speaking in a promising rhetoric. So what can you do? If you look at the Corbyn and Sanders uh, campaigns, they were all speaking about reindustrialization, bringing up back the labor rights, basically trying to secure the sort of better position of workers that used to be there when the uh, US or the UK were still on uh, top of the uh, 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 global hierarchy. Uh, so. From that perspective, how can you address meaningfully uh, a new situation when, when there is this 
increased militarization of the China-US conflict and your states and capitalists are asking all the workers to uh, stand uh, behind them. Uh, and uh, in Eastern Europe, we also see this effect very much in, in the reactions of this new left that I'm also part of uh, uh, to the Ukraine uh, crisis. Uh, when, you know, if you allow yourself, then, then you, it's not only tragic, it's also tragic comical what's going on in terms of left reactions. Uh, it's basically completely uh, irrealistic symbolic claims and debates about those symbolic claims. And I don't think this is because anybody here is stupid or irres irresponsible. It's mainly because <laughs> of the complete inexistence of an organizational base uh, that <laughs> would have that could have legitimacy through its power to do anything. And here I don't mean stopping the, you know, uh, uh, Russian uh, military jets. I just mean things like uh, maybe even just being organized enough to, to be able to, to decide that we all are going to support the Ukrainian comrades campaign for uh, uh, the forgiveness of uh, Ukraine's debts. Uh, or even uh, on the ground help. I mean, if you look at who has been doing on the ground help, it has been mostly liberal NGOs and, and also states. Um, okay. Uh, I don't want to stop just with the negative part. So, of what are the, you know, the thinking that goes beyond this? Uh, I, uh, what are the most uh, inspiring directions of it uh, for me? So, we saw that. Uh, after the failure of the Sanders and Corbyn campaigns, what is, has become sort of a, a dominant trend uh, in Anglo-Saxon left was this turn towards unions and within unions, the revival of this earlier similar context, similar uh, train of thought, uh, new left idea of rank and file organizing. Uh, and I think this is good, but it has to be married to a reproductive dimension uh, I, I won't go into this because it's late, but uh, uh, if it remains a workplace organizing that is wage-oriented, then it remains bound to growing profitability, and it is not a possible claim now. So this is what uh, groups like uh, Theory Communist or uh, Chuang in uh, China call the impossibility of the wage claim. Uh, and the way it is, can be married to reproductive uh, claims, one of the most uh, inspiring examples I see would be the Trade Unions for uh, Energy Democracy, TUED, Global uh, Union Alliance, uh, who say that the contemporary historical role of uh, trade unions should be to act as a workers' organization within the capitalist fossil economy, uh, to basically to transform it uh, towards uh, reproductive priorities. And then just uh, to bring one more relatively concrete uh, example to that, uh, if you have the time to, to read one of these uh, two ad papers, uh, I, I would recommend the one that is called Up From Development. Uh, it is written by Indian uh, trade unionists, and it speaks exactly about industrial policy before the, it became cool. It's around 2018, the paper. So they try to speak about what could be a reproductive-oriented workers' industrial policy in India be, given the completely hard limits on, uh, on energy use uh, the, uh, because of the climate, uh, given the fact that the present uh, reorganization towards renewables has completely oppressive and exploitative effects uh, within India already. So, you know, like uh, coal workers uh, are uh, left without uh, jobs, but the new uh, green infrastructures are not coming to those regions. Obviously, why would they? They go to the regions where the people can pay for it, so it's still uh, profitable. Uh, even the, you know, the industrial uh, 
uh, dependence is also uh, relevant to uh, solar panels, like it's completely uh, Chinese dominated. So if you are in India uh, and you think about it in terms of you know, reproductive oriented national development, your question is also how on earth you are going to uh, get the technical and the material capacity to produce your own solar panels and so on and so forth. Uh, also the huge land grabs that are part of the uh, global biofuel and other uh, renewable uh, turns uh, uh, which are completely exploitative uh, in these places. So the way they speak is that they grasp all these contradictions, but it's not uh, an enumeration of the problems like I just did it, but it is an uh, engagement with all the struggles that are happening on the ground, the anti-land grab of those people who live there, the anti-labor uh, abuse of uh, those people who work in all these industries and so on. And they say that uh, industrial policy necessarily implies a strong people's movement and democratic political process not only to concretize industrial policy, so it's not like yeah, asking some of them to give us the inputs for the policies, uh, but to sustain it. Uh, and I think this is really important to, to show what kind of power it would take to even be able to do anything about this. And they say this participative uh, dimension means spaces where mass organizations and trade unions democratically engage and shape industrial policy and monitor its implementation on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so, you know, uh, whenever I hear discussions about what the left should do or what should be the first three steps of a democratic left government uh, when it uh, uh, starts its uh, uh, tenure, then, then this is what I always think about, like, no, the question is, how do you even create this capacity? And uh, this is it. Um, okay, uh, thank you, uh, Agnes. Uh, I can say I haven't heard such an insightful uh, analysis, especially on uh, position of Eastern Europe from especially from a world system theory um, perspective in a in a very long time and I was also very much intrigued by <laughs> your uh, provocative interpretation of the protest movements as um, basically a middle class phenomenon especially in uh, Eastern Europe uh, so I have a lot of questions but uh, before that, I'd like to open the floor to somebody from the audience, not to monopolize the the mic. Is there any question? Okay. 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 Uh, so, of course, uh, feel free afterwards. Um, on the question of. Uh, <laughs> I have to get back to the to the thing you try to uh, avoid uh, being very concrete about, uh, and that is the issue of uh, what the left should do. Not in uh, term of uh, in Eastern Europe specifically. Not in terms of what should be the concrete policies of a new leftist uh, government, etc. But on a much broader perspective, if you wish, on a, a world system theory perspective. So, what is the potential alternative at all? I mean. Uh, you in the um, in the times when uh, things like um, dependency theory were pop popular, not only popular, but in a way shaped the policies of, of governments. Uh, in a way, there was a lot, lot of talk about uh, the linking and things like uh, basically import uh, substitution, uh, industrialization, and stuff like this. So, what is our from a perspective of periphery? What is the potential uh, long-term uh, solution and long-term strategy um, in, this, in this regard? So how to get out of this uh, uh, dependency trap at all? Well, <laughs> such a nice context, you know, all the debates that were ever about this, we are in one room with them now. Uh, yeah, so just about how I would approach these things. Of course, it's not my idea, it's the idea of the whole tradition, but uh, there's this differentiation between the analysis. So the, for the analysis, you have quite 
concrete tools that is given to you by the methodology of you know historical materials uh, analysis or however you call it uh, but for the strategy the strategy is a different thing because uh, it relies on the smaller scale when your acting capacity is it relies on so many moving uh, uh, given points that it's really a question the method doesn't answer you the question about strategy uh, and then you know historically these preferences towards uh, strategy are decided both by objective context like this we can do this we cannot do and by you know just who gets there in the struggle uh, so in this sense uh, i don't think that there is one good answer to this just because the method exists but um, Getting to this more concrete part of the question on, on dependency, delinking, what to do with the, the peripheral status. So, so yeah, if you start from where the left is now in Eastern Europe, basically nowhere, even if you, you have some people in some positions, in terms of being able to do anything against this immense power through this each aspect of, of East European economy and, and uh, even military uh, power is integrated uh, into the global system. It's really a question if, if your idea is as someone who can still act in this remaining relatively few years uh, would would go towards the linking. So do we even have the perspective in which you can imagine that there would be an East European delinking uh, in the near future? I don't think so. Uh, there is the other aspect of the question, the import substitution industrialization. So it was very much an idea of how to be, become as strong as the industrialized core. And that means that you also subordinate all of your internal relationships for instance, uh, industrial agrarian hierarchies and all that, to the logic of this competition that is defined by the external capitalist context. So in this sense, of course, when your problem is that uh, you have to very fast reorganize everything because of the climate crisis, then import substitution industrialization, the way you think of it, uh, has to be seriously rethought. And that's why I brought this Indian example, because uh, I didn't have time to, to explain all the details of it, but it is one example of, of a very analytically detailed and, and uh, straight, but also practically embedded way of, of still trying to meaningfully grapple with this question on a, on a scale that is big enough. It's not about where to hide with my family or my you know, 15 comrades. It's, it's still about uh, uh, infrastructure building. And, and yeah, the direction that they look at is how to reformulate industrialization in a sense that is about uh, degrowth, that is about industrial development in the completely underdeveloped regions, you know, without electricity, transport, and so on. Uh, and, of course, the, the core of the matter is uh, how to split it from the, from the capitalist priorities based on which uh, they work now and uh, how to instead implement a reproductive uh, priority. Okay, and then your question would be, how on earth we even start into that direction uh, from our position? Uh, and to that, well, it's not like it's, uh, it's the single answer, but I think it can be answered. So what I see is that uh, East European left political work is very much on this, uh, as I said, representative and technocratic uh, track. It doesn't mean that people don't do other things too. It's just that if you look at the balance, uh, one part of it is much more and the other part uh, has to be strengthened. And this other part that would need to be strengthened would be really the, the knowledge, how to reorganize uh, reproductive alternative economic circuits. And uh, the other part of it is how to organize with workers whose interests we share uh, and they work within this economy that we would like to change. And you know this this face-to-face -face intensive uh, mass connection, uh, organized uh, uh, connection, 
it is a very tired trope of, of left speech. I'm even ashamed of saying it, but it's really something that we didn't really do that much, and it really has to be done. Uh, If anybody wants a question, just uh, wave. Um, so <laughs> the other issue about the, uh, about the mid middle class character of the protest movements, uh, starting generally with the crisis. Uh, when you talked, I suddenly remembered all those memoirs of uh, 68ers and uh, even people who were engaged in armed struggle and uh, things like this. And they always or mostly came to the similar conclusion. Oh, but we were all just uh, middle class uh, people who never, you know, basically got to the real uh, uh, working class. Um, but they were in a, also in a very uh, interesting position. They were mostly people who were um, whose parents were working class and they suddenly uh, got the opportunity to, to educate and, and, and stuff like this. But I also remember like this, this is also not unique. Uh, neither this situation nor the 68, uh, if you look at the history of the labor movement, uh, movement, I mean the first organizations in the mid or second half of the 19th century, uh, when we talk about Eastern Europe, it's mostly the same. It's uh, not the uh, mo the the lowest uh, on the f on the food chain, but it's it's usually the the, the more educated and, and uh, better positioned uh, parts uh, of the working class. So uh, my question was would be: Is this basically something with which you can dismiss the whole movement? Like, uh, is is it uh, in fact really um, such an obstacle? I mean, you did give a um, few examples of how it can be, but I'm really not sure that uh, if you could expect um, uh, a different so sort of... I'm, I'm not uh, aware of a historical moment, even a revolutionary historical moment, when, when this dynamic was, was significantly uh, different. If you can think of one, uh, please let me know. Yeah, okay, so... Uh, just to reiterate, I really uh, try to emphasize this, but I know it's hard because the context is so much uh, to that direction. So the context is that if this is this self-flagellation context, that ah, it's middle class, then it's bad. You know, we're not there. We're not the right people. <laughs> that, that's not what I'm trying to do. Uh, so what I was trying to do, yeah, okay. So in, this is the classic uh, lesson of uh, also social movement studies that Whenever you see a social movement, it's quite heterogeneous, but throughout its evolution, uh, where it gets at, in the end, it gets dominated by something. And these 2008 uh, movements, they were middle class dominated. Obviously, not everybody who participated was middle class, but it's the topic of the middle class, the rhetoric of the middle class, the international connections between which could be made exactly through their topics, like this 99% uh, against 1%, the moral, you know, this disillusionment uh, moral drama that we thought that this world was okay, but now it turned out that it's not okay. Uh, so this is the junior position drama. So, and of course there were other people who had problems all the time who participated in the same protests. I mean, even in New York, in uh, uh, the Zuccotti Park, you had uh, lots of homeless people who didn't become homeless in 2008, but uh, even before, okay. But, uh, so this became the, the dominant, uh, how to say, in the politicization, how it became part of political discussions and then even political institutions, this middle class characteristic was dominant of the 2008 uh, story. And by this, I didn't mean to say that then it doesn't count. But I meant to, the, the whole book is about to, to look at how actually this is completely significant. And for me, this was also new, you know, it's part of the learning process that Ah, actually, uh, middle class politics is just as important as an organic part of, you know, the political workings of the whole work, uh, world system uh, as the, uh, of course, the, the basic contradiction of uh, capital and labor is. Uh, and I wanted to look at what is happening here and that fragment of it which turned towards the left, which I am part of, what can we do with all this? 
So the fact that you, you are traveling on a structural wave doesn't mean that you cannot do anything. And this is the basic idea that you have free will, but among the given circumstances. And, and yeah, it was rather about looking around and, and checking out where we are at and then trying to find out what you can do with, with these tools. And the lesson was that that don't only work with the tools that this wave and this structural background gives to you. Uh, so I had, if anybody wants, just just wave. This is the last question I, <laughs> I'll make, not to uh, monopolize this. Um, so do you do you basically see? any um, consequences in the broader narratives or broader political discussions in any Eastern European country of the movements from 2008. Okay, I mean, every country had its spe specificities, but why I'm asking this is also because, as you mentioned in your uh, introduction, uh, also, Zagreb is one of the cities that actually has uh, the go city government that is partly also the consequence of, of similar uh, civil movements. But in a way, I would argue that they they won by uh, the elections by a landslide. But I, I would argue that the vast majority of their support. Uh, actually came from the fact that uh, people uh, of their credibility as uh, basically an anti-corruption movement, not as an anti-neoliberal movement. So in this regard, I would see, it, I would see very, very little uh, consequences even with this political change here. Even here I would see very little uh, consequences of the movements in general po political dis discussion and, and discourse. So I would you say that it's similar in uh, other countries in Eastern Europe or do you see any breakthroughs in this, in this regard? Yeah, so basically I think the dominant effect of the post-2008 uh, demonstrations was not towards the left. The left is a minority case of it, and in some cases it achieved some successes, and Zagreb is a remarkable example of such successes. Uh, but more generally, uh, these East European demonstration waves went through, uh, so structurally, they went through this uh, offended middle class reinforcing its uh, ambition to to join you know western levels of uh, consumption and lifestyle and reclaiming its right to do it and and you know reusing basically the locally available narratives for this which were mostly the narratives of the transition like somebody stole the transition it's because of the communists are still in power that it's happening it's because of the corruption uh, in worst cases of it, like in Romania, it's the, the whole demonstration wave, it was very strong in terms of changing governments uh, several times, but where it went at uh, was, was this uh, even vocally, completely explicitly anti-social alliance with the liberals along this narrative that uh, the communists who are still in power stole the transition because they are corrupt and because they have this corrupt political alliance with the poor who don't work and they are just waiting for the benefits while we, the working middle class who are already, you know, we did our homework, we already look like middle class, uh, the, the proper Western uh, ones, and, and you know, they are keeping us in this in this toilet of a country that they're creating out of this with their corrupt uh, alliance. And you know, structurally, as my Romanian comrades uh, showed it throughout the decade, uh, this shows this kind of uh, process where after 2008, there, there is this new wave of relocated uh, uh, investments into Romania, which creates within the big cities, you know, uh, r locally relatively well-paying IT jobs, uh, management uh, jobs, uh, and the services that surround them. So, you know, suddenly inner Romanian big cities start to look like a normal Western city. And 
what they are managing, you know, where that production happened, uh, where those uh, land grabs happen. Uh, that is the rural uh, sea of poverty, uh, and we don't understand why those guys cannot uh, get civilized like we do in the city center. Uh, so, and the Bulgarian uh, comrades also described the same thing uh, quite, uh, how to say, if you read Jana Tsoneva's uh, writing, uh, she does it also in a literary, <laughs> very literary style, uh, very illustrative, uh, how anti-corruption and, and civil society discourse also becomes the language of this, this completely exclusive, uh, uh, almost yeah, very much in the structural sense, very much uh, right-wing uh, uh, discourse against the local poor and against our own transitional uh, uh, problem, uh, but it is voiced in a pro-Western, pro-liberal vocabulary on the top. Uh, you can also check this by, by reading the, the Western news <laughs> about these demonstrations. So one of the completely re repetitive uh, examples about this would be uh, these uh, images of, uh, of these middle-class dominated city center demonstrations with the phones, you know, this sea of uh, blue light from the smartphones, uh, and then some light that, you know, finally Romanian civil society woke up, Bulgarians step up against corruption, uh, Georgians step up, uh, civil society steps up against corruption. So this is the dominant thing. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, from uh, what you were saying now about uh, middle class consciousness and uh, and the politics after 2000, uh, 2008, uh, could you compare this uh, new left uh, uh, type of organization uh, with the uh, with the classical uh, social democratic uh, 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 politics uh, that were uh, when, when after 2008, when uh, these uh, new movements were st uh, starting to, to build, they would uh, um, they were um, how to say uh, building as a, as an opposition towards uh, social democratic. Uh, uh, the parties uh, that uh, that were um, uh, that we had in Eastern European uh, countries. Uh, so, if you if you also put it in uh, in a historic perspective, uh, uh, do you see uh, or could you predict uh, like a further development and uh, the balance between um, uh, uh, these two parallel? Um, um, uh, like groups of um, of left organizations, uh, or, or 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 to be precise, parties in in the in the whole uh, like region. Yeah, well, it really cuts into a quite complicated topic, and I don't want to be too long. So one of the things I think is that social democratic politics in the region after 80, uh, 89 is totally not the same. Uh, so some of it is actually about some uh, agreements with at, at least uh, the selected unions and you know, some sort of at least embedded neoliberalism type of reforms. Uh, others are about protectionist uh, nationalists, you know, building the local uh, capitalists and then promising something to workers uh, based on that. Uh, then again, others are just completely neoliberal and you you don't even understand uh, why it's called like that. Um, and if the question is whether the trajectory of the new left and its political institutionalization could resemble that in any way, no, I don't think so, because um, only because, you know, the, the historical moment was uh, so much different. Nobody is going to make any kind of working political capital out of managing the privatization of the region uh, uh, once again. Uh, so yeah, I don't think that that direction uh, exists anymore. But we can continue. Maybe I misunderstood the question. 
Someone else? Okay. Uh, uh -huh. Okay, thank you. I mean, I was thinking whether I should go uh, on this route, but maybe it it can be fruitful. So, considering uh, all you said about these huge dynamics, long term, long term dynamics, is it possible to organize a long term struggle without basing it in? in some long-term projection of a struggle for a positive project that might even be um, look utopian at the moment, but that enables some kind of subjectivity for a long-term struggles. So like um, municipal, municipalism seems to, uh, to um, shorten scope, uh, good life or good politics uh, just responds to a kind of a moral economy. Uh, it doesn't have that like long-term uh, moment, the green agenda is uh, still monopolized by the, the, by the li liberal agenda. So some kind of, a, I don't know, socialist, communist perspective, having in mind all, all, all that you said about the real socialist projects of the past, yes? But uh, some kind of the articulation, not because we are strong enough to carry that mental proper, but because we don't want to constantly have our like small micro efforts uh, ap appropriated like uh, you know this moment of 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 Gramscian term Gramscian term of of transformism where they are articulated in the politics of the pro capitalist center and uh, like from all you talk I mean one would expect that one of the like big issues would be what the left should do. Not like before you had like from the beginning of, of the crisis where there was really no organizational capacity and that would, you would have like these big philosophical discussions, you know, like what this like abstract left, like who is the, the revolutionary subject of change and all of that. But now we have some concrete si situations, some minuscule, minuscule left, but uh, some something to work with. So... Um, I mean, it's not only the, the symbolic the dimension, but the ability to to project our wishes uh, the, the, into the future, so that, uh, that we are not constantly being like uh, sidetracked, and uh, like um, even even maybe anti-capitalism, although it is uh, an, uh, not like a positive project, but it uh, it seems that it could maybe carry that mantle of uh, of of a need for a big change that could uh, um, attract some people to itself. Uh, the, the, I'm thinking of maybe like a long term uh, the, the, the people that needs to work on, on this project long term, not only this like uh, uh, intermediate or like short uh, uh, incursions into the um, wider base on, on this like uh, the, reaction to moral economy or uh, to the, the to the breaking of the moral economy i don't know if i i think i have several points to that again we'll try to be sure maybe it won't work so one of the points is that even if you have the clear anti-capitalist uh, long-term uh, goal and it is completely explicit like it used to be in the historical socialist movement uh, it doesn't guarantee that throughout history you know your structural contribution won't be uh, co-opted like it was uh, not yeah there is actually a quite uh, for me, it was illuminating uh, analysis uh, of this uh, word systems guys of, of how it actually happened, but maybe this is not the good time to go into it. But anyway, so it it can happen even then. So it's it's really not about what kind of structurally, it's not about what kind of intention you formulate at the moment, most probably, but it's rather about uh, 
what kind of incursion you do into the real structural process on the level of the real structural process. Now, of course, if you are small, then what can you do? You can just optimize that small force. There are not much more than you can do. And in a moment when most probably we all are facing this mass extinction and you know the window to do anything about that is closing within a few years, uh, it's hard to to formulate a political agenda on the systemic level that would sound super positive or hopeful. That's why I also, whenever these you know, gatherings, people ask uh, uh, each other to, to say what is an inspiring hope that they can think of. I don't think the motivation for action is the inspiring hope. It is what you want to be as a human. Now that we humans are facing this, what are you going to do? You're going to hide your concepts somewhere? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I think what we should do is to optimize the little power that we have uh, in a direction that increases, you know, the, the human agency that we think is worthy of it. Uh, if you read Holocaust literature of, of communists, uh, uh, they, they say this as a lived experience too. Uh, and then, okay, so within that uh, big framework, uh, a bit more about this cooptation uh, issue when you are small, doing some small things. Uh, here I think uh, what you do concretely uh, can have a big role. So if you take this representative uh, track, then, then the little things that you can do very much rely on these waves of the electoral politics that are moved not by you. And this can even be beneficial if you're trying to build some kind of left power because it might turn out in such a way, like you said, maybe against uh, corruption, people will vote for you and then you will have more positions to do something. That can be completely something good. But uh, where the, the practical positions where the, you know, where the direction that are, can be meaningful for the direction are actually when you engage in those kind of conflicts. I mean, when you organize with workers during COVID, uh, it is just so clear, it cannot be even more clearer where the conflicts are. Uh, th those are not conflict lines that can be co-opted by, uh, by, you know, these uh, uh, electoral waves or anything. The question is whether you work with that uh, or, or you work with other things. And, and I think in this sense, we still have the power to choose to, to really <laughs> work with the issues that engage with the conflict lines and, and build power on one side of them. I mean, I guess I was, I was thinking more like uh, not ec externally from the organization to outwards. Uh -huh but more like internally, how does one set up an organization to last for, I don't know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you know, like without c casting s some kind of, uh, like, the, uh, because it, it seems that it's uh, very, very easy to, to get sidetracked, and I think that the long-term project, the organization, kind of organizations that have, the, uh, like, the long-term capacity do need to have that, discussion so not only what we are doing at the moment and like taking things as they are coming at us and helping people but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah I know what you mean. So again one of the lessons is that nothing saves you from historical change even the best organization who knows where it will be in 10 20 years so it's you know each moment you have to engage but the other thing that I said also applies that in what direction, what kind of embeddedness, on what side of some conflicts that you pick, where you build the organization, the next time something happens, the organization will be there on that side of that conflict. So one of the things that you know, <laughs> is quite uh, inspiring example in this China-US uh, story, when uh, you know, both countries uh, ideological machineries are uh, brainwashing people to think that uh, they are on two sides of a conflict. Uh, one of the things that uh, labor organizers within uh, the IT industry have been doing, it, it, it was earlier. So before this became the trade war story 
sparked out so, so visibly. Uh, and they were just uh, US IT workers who sometimes worked in China within the same circuits and then back in the US and everything. And they saw that uh, they were fucked in the same way in the, both places. And they started to organize and they even uh, used uh, tricks that we probably who are not in the industry wouldn't even think of. Like when there was this uh, bigger China, uh, Chinese IT workers uh, uh, strike, uh, they would uh, uh, collect support for it on uh, GitHub, and that's how the U.S. guys would get uh, involved. So, you know, they just built out a network <laughs> uh, throughout these smaller things, and then the way that network re reacted to this trade war when it was sparked uh, was obviously from a different uh, position uh, than from even the Sanders uh, uh, team uh, would react to because they just didn't have this kind of organizational Im embeddedness. And, and that's why I think that, okay, we are in a crisis, nobody's going to save us, it's just get, going to get even worse. But each minute what you do, you know, it, it, it still counts whether you build it into the right direction. I think it's about time we wrapped it up. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you again Agnes for, for your talk and see you on other events hopefully.